Hi, my name is Katherine Ketterman, and I'm the historical director for Better Days 2020, a local nonprofit working to share stories from Utah women's history. I'm excited to talk with you today about Utah women's work for voting rights, and especially how citizenship and rights changed for Utah women across the suffrage movement. I'm going to share my screen with you, and then we'll begin. Great. So I wanted to start off with an overview of Utah women's voting rights because in this year, 2020, we've been commemorating several different important anniversaries for voting rights, both right here in Utah and across the country. So in 2020, we marked the 150th anniversary of Utah women's first votes back in February of 1870. We also celebrated the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment that was ratified in passed into law in 1920. That was just a couple of weeks ago in August. And also the 55th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. And I, it's, I wanted to start off with this because it's important to keep this time frame in mind, to recognize that the part that we often call the suffrage movement is just one small part of the history of women's work for equal voting rights, both here in Utah and across the country as well. Work for women's equal rights began long before 1920 and then extended long afterward and work for equal access to the ballot continues today. I'm going to give you a brief overview of a couple of the important time points we'll talk about today later on in my presentation. Utah women gained the right to vote for the first time in 1870, but that was a beginning of a complicated and a, a complicated struggle back and forth between local government and national government. So Utah women's voting rights were actually revoked in 1887 after women had been voting for 17 years by Congress. Women regained the vote with the state constitution in 1896, but then they continued to work for federal protections for voting rights by working for the 19th Amendment. Even after the 19th Amendment was ratified in 1920, many women still couldn't actually cast ballots due to discriminatory U.S. citizenship laws and state regulations in some places that prevented women from voting based on their race or national origin. Further legislation was needed to explicitly protect voting rights from being curtailed in these ways. And so that work continued up to the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and continues today. So when we're thinking about voting rights, looking at that time frame, I want you to remember that Utah was first. It's a really important piece of that story to understand um, that voting rights spread in practical application from the West to the East. So why was the West so early? When we learn about national suffrage leaders like Susan B. Anthony, Sojourner Truth, Lucy, Paul, Lucy Burns, Alice Paul, excuse me, and Ida B. Wells, what was happening right here in our own home state? Why was Utah the first place where women actually voted? And, and what made that happen? What made it possible? We'll talk about that in the presentation today. But it's important to remember that suffrage and the right to vote was not the only goal or just this narrow focus of Utah women's work for voting rights. The women's rights movement was about much, much more. And it was really suffrage was seen as the tool that women could use to improve their subordinated legal, social, and economic status in other ways. So as the women's rights movement moved forward through the late 19th century, people began to focus in on the vote as the tool that would enable them to achieve their other goals. Let's talk now about what makes Utah's role in that suffrage history so unique. There are three reasons why Utah's suffrage story is really different than the way it played out in many other places. And the first one is that it happened so early. Women citizens in Utah gained the right to vote both in 1870 and then again in 1896. So that was twice before 1900. By the time the 19th Amendment became law, Utah women had been voting for a total of 41 years. And that changed some of the things that happened both here locally as well as shaping the conversation nationally about women's voting rights. Another way that voting rights history played out differently here in Utah than in other places was that Utah suffragists generally enjoyed broad community support. And that included both from local political leaders as well as Latter-day Saint religious leaders and others in the community. It wasn't across the board. It didn't mean that everybody agreed on women's right to vote or hold office, but it did mean that women didn't face the same stiff opposition here as they did in other places when they tried to expand women's access to the ballot or ability to run for public office in some ways. And we'll talk about that as we go forward. And the third reason why Utah's suffrage story was really unique and complicated was polygamy. The Mormon practice of polygamy in the 19th century was both an accelerating and a complicating factor in Utah's suffrage story. 
polygamy definitely shaped that story in many ways and in some ways determined when those conversations happened that led to the enfranchisement of Utah women in 1870. Um, it also led to women's disenfranchisement at the hands of Congress in 1887. But whatever the reasons why women's voting rights were discussed in Utah, the main thing that's important to me is that we shouldn't dismiss women's political experience, a very real political experience that they gained as voters and for many stepping onto the national stage to defend their voting rights and in some cases their religious practices as well. Through voting and petitioning and lobbying and working with national suffrage organizations and working here in Utah inside local political party structures, many Utah women came to see and describe themselves as citizens whose civil rights merited the federal government's protection. And that doesn't sound radical now, but it was new for the late 1800s. It was different than what women were experiencing and expressing in the rest of the country. This was also happening at a time when suffrage activity was not as widespread in the rest of the country as it was here in Utah. Utahns consistently punched above their weight, like in the number of petition signatures that they gathered, for example. Women here in Utah, and men as well, were committed to the cause, working for the 19th Amendment to spread it elsewhere too, and really leading out in many ways on women's rights and shaping that conversation. So to understand why that was, we're going to need to go back to 1870 to find out. As we set the stage here, thinking about the time in which Utah women gained voting rights for the first time, we've got to think about it in context of the Civil War. Aftermath of the Civil War, and we often talk about reconstruction in the South after the war ended, but that also applied to the West. With the end of slavery and the 13th Amendment sparking national conversations about who was a citizen and who should get to vote, national discussions centered on these questions. The 14th Amendment that was passed in 1868 stated that all people born in the United States were citizens. Um, ironically, that did not include American Indians and there were lots of holes here, but that seemed to say for many people that women were citizens for the first time. That was a new, a new interpretation and that would be debated and, and discussed over the next coming decades. But the amendment also did something else. It described voters as male for the first time and it codified something that many states had been doing since 1807, which was saying that only men could vote. You have to remember here that the United States Constitution doesn't lay out any qualifications for voters or specify who can participate in election. That was left up to the states. And suffragists didn't like this introduction of the word male when describing voters. So that was one thing that was going on. Expansions in many ways for voting rights with the 15th Amendment expanding voting rights to black men, while also maybe codifying some limitations that had been previously enacted in different states based on sex. But there was another reconstruction debate going on at the same time that also affected Utah's suffrage story. And that was what to do about polygamy in Utah territory. Congress wanted to end it. If you remember back to US history classes you may have taken in the past, Republicans controlled Congress. Their party platform back even before the Civil War started called for ending the twin relics of barbarism. That was slavery and also polygamy. And so now once the Civil War had in their eyes ended slavery, they turned their attention towards polygamy and how they could abolish that. New stricter anti-polygamy legislation was being proposed in Congress and some of that would strip citizens of the right to vote, hold office, or serve on a jury. And you can imagine that this only applied to men at the time because only men had those rights legally at the time. But some national suffrage leaders saw an opening here. They were trying to get congressmen to propose legislation that would extend voting rights to women. And they saw an opening with this confluence of anti-polygamy and their movement suffrage to try to extend voting rights to women, first of all in Western territories, and then just in Utah as a way to end polygamy. So national suffrage leaders tried to marry the two causes and they argued that if women had the ballot, that they would use their political power to end the practice on their own. This was an argument that Susan B. Anthony and others made to Congress. So these proposed bills didn't pass in 1869 and 1870, but they sparked discussion right here in Utah about whether women should be voters. Many Utahns who were Latter-day Saints were concerned about these proposed anti-polygamy laws in Congress, and women actually inserted themselves into the political debate as well. Leading Latter-day Saint women gathered together in early 1870 for what were called indignation meetings. And those were really common in the United States, especially before the Civil War as well as after. These were ways to protest an unpopular government policy or leader. 
when they would gather hundreds or even thousands of people together, have speakers talk about what was going wrong, what was going right, and they would draw up resolutions and send a petition to government to let them know how they as citizens felt. So Latter-day Saint women planned indignation meetings to protest a specific bill, the Colum Bill, that was an anti-polygamy bill going through Congress at the time. Thousands of women gathered, first in Salt Lake City in January, and then in dozens of meetings more throughout Utah Territory. In these indignation meetings, many of these women spoke to talk about what they had given up to practice their faith, how persecution had driven them from place to place until they ended up here in the Great Basin. Um, they talked about the U.S. Constitution and the First Amendment right of religious freedom. They talked about how they were willing participants in the practice of polygamy. They said that others may have portrayed them as downtrodden, deluded, victims in need of saving, but they wanted to show a different image and to speak for themselves. Um, they very cleverly banned all men from these meetings except for newspaper reporters so that the reports would get out of these articulate, educated Mormon women speaking for themselves. These meetings ended up putting Mormon women on the political map, both nationally and here in Utah. And we know that some of the leading women who are organizing these meetings wanted the vote. At one of their planning meetings, they actually voted to demand suffrage rights from the governor. And we don't have a record that they ever actually made this demand, but the sheer organizational feat of holding these meetings, the publicity that they drew and their articulateness showed that women could be effective players in politics. And in many ways, I imagine that that contributed to Utah legislators' willingness to pass a law that enfranchised women citizens. So in February of 1870, just a few weeks after these meetings started, Utah's territorial legislature voted unanimously to pass a law that extended voting rights to women citizens. That made Utah the second place to do so after Wyoming, Wyoming territory. But due to the timing of elections, Utah women were actually the first to go to the polls and exercise this right. So they became the first women to vote under equal suffrage laws that made their voting rights the same as men's. Sarah Young, the woman you see pictured here, both in an illustration and in a photograph, was the first woman that we know of who voted in Salt Lake City's municipal election on February 14th. About 25 women voted that day, and others voted in city elections later on elsewhere in Utah. For example, we know that about 600 women voted in Provo's election just a little bit later that spring, and then thousands of women voted across the Utah Territory in the general election held that August. So what did it look like for women to vote at this time? We know in the general election that there were separate entrances set up for women at polling places, and there was a concern that, that women might not like the atmosphere on election day. There were often speeches um, being given outside polling places. There were often brass bands. We know that one was playing outside of Council Hall, the building that you see here, which is where Sarah cast her first vote. Um, it, was, it was a really kind of a rowdy experience uh, to participate in an election in 19th century United States. And as Utah women started participating, they started shaping political culture and changing some of that dynamic as well. Women like Sarah Kimball here in Utah were instrumental in setting up civic education classes through LDS Relief Societies. As soon as women had the vote, she and other women leaders were hoping to use the vote to elevate women economically and socially and legally. And so they wanted to make sure that women would be informed voters. The question was, what actually happened when Utah women started voting? Did anything change? The first substantial population of women voters was here in Utah. Again, women were voting in Wyoming also in 1870, although a little later on, but Utah had about 20 times the population as Wyoming's. But there was a lot of attention and scrutiny that Utah women's voted, votes excuse me, attracted from people across the country. People were wondering what women would do as voters, just in general, and outsiders were also particularly watching to see if women would somehow vote out polygamy or change the system in ways that would cause that practice to end. When it became clear that that wasn't happening, people both inside and out of Utah started crusading to overturn or revoke the women's voting laws here. There were local lawsuits brought against the law, and that suffrage law was challenged in local court cases, and then congressional legislation also proposed stripping Utah women of their right to vote almost every year from 1873 onward. One of the women who was instrumental in shaping that debate was a woman here in Utah named Jenny Froiseth, you see pictured here in an illustration by Brooke Smart. 
Jenny was a firm believer in suffrage, and she was even an officer in the National Woman Suffrage Association. But she argued that first and foremost, the most important thing the government could do to help women would be to end polygamy. If women's votes were upholding polygamy at this point, as she argued, then they needed to be stripped of voting rights until polygamy could be abolished. So Utah women's voting rights became a political football in this conflict over the practice of polygamy between local territorial leaders and federal appointees, as well as the federal government. And this is where Utah women really started to get involved in what we would call the suffrage movement to defend their own voting rights. And for Mormon women, many of them were defending their religious practice as well. The Woman's Exponent was a newspaper founded here in Salt Lake City in 1872. Latter-day Saint women used this newspaper to share their story from their perspective. Uh, the newspaper shared news of women's rights locally, nationally, and internationally. You can see reports like women have been accepted to medical school in Germany or things like this. The newspaper also reported on local LDS Relief Society activities and, and organizations. The paper encouraged women to register and vote and also to naturalize if they were immigrants so that they could gain voting rights. And it also especially shared news of suffrage organizations across the US and really tied Utah women into the debates, the strategies and tactics that were being employed across the country at the time. The Exponent became one of the longest running women's newspapers of, it, of its kind, it went on until 1914. But Emmeline B. Wells, the woman here, became the editor of the Exponent in 1877. And as that editor, as that editor role brought her into the role of sharing information, of acting as a clearinghouse, and of getting the word out and organizing some suffrage activity, she became Utah's best known suffragist. She connected with Susan B. Anthony's National Woman Suffrage Association to petition for a federal woman suffrage amendment. This would have been the 16th Amendment if it had been enacted in 1877. And women across the country were gathering petition signatures in favor of this amendment. So Emmeline Wells put that out in the Woman's Exponent and gathered signatures in Utah and organized others to gather signatures across the territory. Utah actually gathered more signatures for that petition than any other state or territory in the United States at the time. That resulted in an invitation for Wells and some others to go back east to represent Utah at suffrage conventions held by the NWSA in Washington, DC. Emmeline Wells and others met with lawmakers and even presidents over the years, trying to get them to back off on anti-polygamy legislation. She and others were arguing that that would actually harm Mormon women by destroying their families. But there was another piece to that argument that came out as women continued to participate in the political process here in Utah. It was really in some ways unintentional and surprising to a lot of people that women in Utah and their votes were becoming this focal point. But it really was when Americans were talking about the idea of women's suffrage or women voting in the 1870s or the 1880s, the main place where that was actually happening was here in Utah. And as women employed their political strategies to try to protect their right to vote against anti-polygamy legislation that would have also stripped that right to vote from them, they argued that they enjoyed more legal rights here in Utah than women in most other parts of the United States at the time. And this was in many ways true. For example, married women in Utah could own property when that wasn't necessarily the case everywhere. And there were more liberal divorce, inheritance, and child custody laws here that gave more legal power to wives and mothers. And also there were other things going on as well. During this time, Utah women who had been voting for a couple of years now started to lobby the legislature to pass a law opening up public office to women. The legislature actually passed the law, but the federally appointed governor of Utah vetoed it. Um, but no matter what, you can see that women were really engaging and involving themselves in political debates in the political process, both here in Utah and nationally, as that question was discussed in the halls of Congress and elsewhere. Women in Utah sent petitions, they spoke at national conventions, they, they wrote newspaper articles, and they directly lobbied federal officials to try to get their points across. And in these petitions, some of which we, you can see pictured here, they pointed to these rights that they enjoyed in Utah, the right to vote, the right to own property and homestead and own land and, and control their own wages. And they also pointed to the fact that they were voters. This was a way to show that they were better off than women in many other parts of the country, to try to say that the federal government should leave them alone or that the government should be protecting these rights rather than trying to strip them from women. <laughs> 
when you look at these petitions that they were sending back to Washington, D.C. and elsewhere, it's interesting to compare them with petitions being sent by suffragists from other parts of the country at the same time. So while others were asking the federal government to remove their political disabilities, in other words, extend rights to them to allow them to vote, Utahns were asking the government to protect rights that they already had. Other women across the United States, including Susan B. Anthony, Sojourner Truth, and Virginia Minor, were being arrested for voting or prevented from voting or registering to vote, while Utah women were going to the polls legally, quietly, and peacefully. Utah women would say things in these petitions like, we are independent voters, we have elevated the political discourse, we have shown that things go okay when women vote, the sky doesn't fall, families don't disintegrate. All of the arguments that were being leveled against why women should vote, Utah women argued that their experience showed otherwise, that women were important political citizens, that they could elevate the political discourse, and that they'd been doing it for over a decade. As they talked about themselves as voters, you can see their descriptions of themselves change, and eventually they come to describe their right to vote as a vested right, one that the federal government could not take away. Now, of course, these rights were limited to U.S. citizens at the time, and U.S. citizenship laws meant that some people were completely excluded from that right, including American Indians and other women who lived here in Utah, and we'll talk about that later. But one of the important things to note here is that women in Utah were the first ones to counter a lot of that anti-suffrage rhetoric, the arguments that women would vote only as their husbands told them to, that women were too emotional or unintelligent to have a say in politics, or that they were uninterested in the political affairs. As voters, Utah women showed that their experience, or argued that their experience showed otherwise, that women could be important political players, that they could elevate the discussions, and that they could make society better when they had a say at the ballot box. Still, unfortunately for these women, Congress eventually did end up revoking Utah women's voting rights as part of anti-polygamy legislation that included many other measures. In 1882, Congress disenfranchised all polygamists, so that was men and women. And in 1887, Congress repealed Utah's woman suffrage law through the Edmonds-Tucker Act. So that meant that no woman in Utah, married or single, monogamous or polygamous, uh, Mormon or not, could register or vote. And suffragists in Utah, who again had been voting for about 17 years at this point, organized a Utah branch of the National Woman Suffrage Association to win back the right to vote. Not all suffrage organizations were willing to work with them, and you'll hear more about that in upcoming presentations in, across the course of this month, but they did work with Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton's National Woman Suffrage Association that was pushing for a constitutional amendment. Suffragists here in Utah in the local branch were especially focused on the opportunities that would open up with Utah statehood. They hoped that when Utah became a state, that they would be able to ensure that women's right to vote would be written into the state constitution and protected that way in a way that Congress couldn't rescind it again. Utah women were really involved in this movement, partly because of the organizational capacity of the LDS Relief Society, partly because women had been voting for so long, we know of suffrage organizations in at least 21 territories out of the 27 at the time, and there were many more town organizations as well. Women often met monthly, including some men, in LDS Relief Society halls or courthouses, so both in small towns and larger cities across Utah. And at these meetings, they would sing songs from the Utah Woman Suffrage Songbook that you see here. They would give speeches and lectures about women's rights and about why women should be equal legally to men. They would teach lessons about political issues of the day to educate themselves as future voters, and they would also plan events and fundraisers. They wanted to keep the issue of women's rights in the public eye, so they would hold balls and socials and parties. They would march in the 4th of July and 24th of July parades locally just to remind people that this issue was important to them. There was, again, as I have mentioned earlier, a widespread support for suffrage among the general population in Utah. But these women and men who were part of the suffrage association were trying to ensure that both political parties would include it in their platforms when the time came. In 1894, as debates started to heat up, as Utah was invited to apply for statehood, they lobbied both political parties and did succeed in having both political parties include support for women's suffrage in their platforms. That meant that the 107 delegates who were elected to Utah's constitutional convention in some ways were obligated or they felt um, some need to enact women's suffrage again. In 
And eventually in 1895, as delegates met to actually draft Utah's proposed state constitution, they would debate and improve a measure that did re-enfranchise women and allow them to vote, or excuse me, allowing them to vote and to hold public office for the first time. Utah suffragists again though had made that happen by meeting with all of the delegates, gathering petition signatures in favor of suffrage, and they packed into the building to hear debates and to show the delegates that women were interested in political questions and that they weren't going to let this moment pass by. Women like Lucy Hepler of Sevier County quickly gathered thousands or hundreds and thousands of signatures across the territory when it became clear that some people were trying to keep suffrage out of the Constitution. They argued that it might make Congress reject Utah statehood once more. They argued that not everybody thought that women should vote or that women were represented by their husbands already. But women like Lucy and others gathered a show of public support through these petition signatures that reminded delegates of their promises, reminded them of their party platform, and ultimately succeeded in including this clause in Utah's state constitution. It reads, the right of citizens of the state of Utah to vote and hold office shall not be denied or abridged on account of sex. Both male and female citizens of this state shall enjoy equally all civil, political, and religious rights and privileges. That's pretty powerful. When Utah entered the Union finally in January of 1896, it was the third suffrage state. And again, as I've mentioned, this allowed women to vote who were citizens as well as to hold public office for the first time. Very soon after the Constitutional Convention wrapped up in the spring of 1895, NASA leaders held a regional convention in Salt Lake City. Just after that Constitutional Convention closed, Susan B. Anthony and Anna Howard Shaw pulled up. And this was a triumphal moment for Utah women who got to highlight what they had achieved and how they had achieved it, talking about their strategies of lobbying legislators, of meeting with them, of serving lunch at elections to remind people that women's rights were important and those sorts of things. As Utah women from across the territory spoke to the convention, they detailed their work, they detailed their belief in women's equality, and they helped to plan upcoming pushes for suffrage in states like Idaho and Montana and other Western states. You can see many women in this picture here with Susan B. Anthony seated in the middle wearing glasses. Many of these women in this, in this photo would go on to run for political office themselves. You can see Dr. Martha Hughes Cannon on the left, for example. This group includes women of both political parties and women across religious divides as well. In the next year, they would be voting, they would be running for office, and they would be making a difference in public policy. In fact, in 1896, three women would win state office, being elected to the state legislature. Eleven would win county offices across the state. And women were also allowed to sit on juries. Um, the Utah legislature would make that clear in 1898, becoming the first state to do so, although women wouldn't really start sitting on juries for, for real in substantial numbers until about the 1930s. But so what did women's political participation look like in the early years of Utah statehood? Besides running for office, how did women try to affect public policy and influence political discussions that were happening here and nationally? I wanna highlight the black women's clubs that existed in Salt Lake City during this time period. Black women in Utah were running their own organizations in the late 19th and early 20th century, both here in Utah as well as in the rest of the United States. And these organizations were usually focused on advancing a broad coalition of human and civil rights. They were suffragists as well, and they supported women's right to vote, but their concerns were not often acknowledged by women who were leading the organizations here in Utah. So these Black women gathered together to work to bring women together for political power, for social uplift, to fight lynching, to open up professional opportunities, etc. Elizabeth Taylor, the woman pictured here, worked both through newspapers, clubs, and the Black churches in Utah in order to improve conditions for Black families. Elizabeth and her husband, William Taylor, ran the Utah Plain Dealer, and they founded, she founded, excuse me, the Western Federation of Colored Women in 1904. That was her term at the time. At the opening convention in July of 1904, Taylor said that she believed that colored women, again, her term, needed to stand together more than any other class of civilized women. And she went on to outline the intersectional barriers of race and sex that Black women faced. She outlined programs that she wanted her federation to undertake in order to 
improve living and working conditions for Black families. That meant increasing educational and professional opportunities. That meant charity work and so much more. The Federation would go on to hold benefits and fundraisers in Salt Lake City, working to establish an orphanage and an old folks home, among other endeavors. This was one of many clubs around the country at the time that were enacting the motto of the National Association of Colored Women, which was lifting as we climb. Elizabeth Taylor and other Black women in Salt Lake City were also politically active. They were trying to use their voting power to enact the changes they wanted to see as well. As a secretary in the Colored Women's Republican Club, Elizabeth took notes of rallies and she canvassed for political candidates. You can even see reports of Elizabeth and other women being reimbursed by the local party for their expenses. Taylor's husband also ran for state senate in 1896 in that same race made famous by Martha Hughes Cannon's election. At one rally, however, in 1890, in, in the early years of Utah statehood, the Colored Women's Republican Club warned members to beware of statements made by certain registrars that, quote, colored ladies as well as working girls are not entitled to register. So we know actually that there weren't any laws on paper that kept black women from the polls or prevented them from legally being able to register and vote. But we can see them here pushing against some boundaries, some social boundaries of discrimination that might have otherwise kept them out. And the very existence of the Colored Women's Republican Club in Utah says something about the, colored, about the color line. So women like Elizabeth Taylor were instrumental both in encouraging and in improving voter registration and turnout and in making their voices heard to use the political process to change the situation in Utah. You can see Elizabeth in many other reports moving on as she was instrumental in um, encouraging people to be involved in politics as well as the churches here in Salt Lake City. And you can see her working against segregation in Salt Lake City businesses as well. Another important woman who brings another dimension to the suffrage story in Utah is Hannah Ka'aepa. She had been born in Hawaii and she emigrated to Utah when she was in her 20s, along with her mother and some other family members to join other Latter-day Saints. They lived in Yosepa, which was out in Tooele County, west of Salt Lake City. And that same year that they emigrated to Utah in 1898 was the year that the United States annexed Hawaii, making it a territory. Well, it became a territory in 1900. But in 1899, Hannah was invited to go back east with other Utah suffrage leaders to speak to the National Council of Women in Washington, D.C. In Hannah's speech, she spoke in both English and Hawaiian, and she urged the members of that National Council of Women to support the Hawaiian queen, Liliuokalani, in her efforts to secure suffrage for Hawaiian women. Hawaii had a long tradition of women in government before the U.S. takeover, and women were banned from voting then at, the at that time. So as Hannah spoke and she presented flower lace to leaders like Susan B. Anthony and May Wright Sewell, she was doing what she could to make sure that these national women's leaders couldn't ignore or sideline the concerns of women of color. Eventually, the passage of the 19th Amendment would enable women in Hawaii to regain a small portion of the political power they once held. And it was women like Hannah who had moved that forward. After Utah statehood, as women began to run for office and lobby politicians to, to change policies and, and engage in the political process in many other ways, they were also continuing to work for the federal women's suffrage amendment. They were continuing some focus on women's voting rights, again, as a tool to advance women's equality and women's rights in other parts of the country, as well as Utah. Utah women were often called to testify before Congress about the positive effects of suffrage here. Uh, for example, in 1898, Martha Hughes Cannon, who was serving as a state senator at the time, told Congress that none of the unpleasant results had occurred that had been predicted. Um, women were still able to take care of their families. They weren't um, throwing the whole system out. They weren't becoming men, um, but that the system was working as women and men had a say in government. She said that women had had opinions and political beliefs before they'd been able to be involved in politics in that way, but that as they were voting, they were able to contribute to the discourse and really shape the state for good in many ways. Many women won election as lawmakers and worked to improve women's conditions. We had about 16 state legislature, legislators um, elected before 1920. And these women often worked on issues like improving women's conditions by 
legislating a minimum wage for women workers or protecting women and child workers. They also focused on improvements for public health and maternal health as well. In 1900, this is one of my favorite stories, the Provo Ladies Democratic Club protested a plan that the county party had that was nominating only men for county offices. They also protested that the female county clerk was making less than her male counterpart. These women said, we resent the intimation that in spite of equal suffrage, the women of Utah remain non-entities. They demanded a visible recognition of the joint responsibilities that male and female citizens share. And you can see that echoed in many of the conversations that we're even still having today here in Utah. Utah women who were working for suffrage and for a 19th Amendment at this point aligned with both wings of the movement for women's voting rights. They aligned with the more moderate NASA as well as the more militant National Women's Party. There were all of the divisions over strategy and tactics here in Utah that there were nationwide. Women met to petition. They met to lobby lawmakers. As you see here in this photo, they're meeting with Senator Smoot of Utah, um, encouraging him to continue his support for the 19th Amendment in Congress. You also saw women parading and holding these, these spectacles to gather publicity, as well as a few who went back east to picket in front of the White House. Here's another photo outside of the National Women's Party headquarters on Main Street in Salt Lake City. Women were holding meetings here about monthly, and these sashes and flags would have been in those iconic colors that Alice Paul um, made so popular in the 19 teens in the suffrage movement. So gold, white, and purple as those colors of suffrage. Again, from the records and from the small evidence that we do have and the hints of reports in, in newspapers and other things, we can tell that thousands of Utah women were involved in this push for voting rights. When the 19th Amendment finally became law in 1920, Utah had been one of the earlier states to ratify it and back in the fall of 1919. And the four women in Utah state legislature had led the way on that ratification. When it was finally ratified by the 36th state and became law on August 26, 1920, the 19th Amendment said that the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. That meant that women could no longer be kept from the ballot box because they were women, but it didn't mean that all women were now able to cast ballots. And this is an important piece of the suffrage story that continued forward. And for example, there were numerous other pieces of legislation that were necessary to knock down barriers that prevented women from voting due to their race, their national origin, or their economic status. Um, I'll talk about a few of these in conjunction with a few women's stories here in Utah, but the important details to know are the Indian Citizenship Act in 1924, um, Although Utah and other states continued to have restrictions on residents of reservations from voting, it's important to know about the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1952 that allowed Asian immigrants to become citizens and therefore gain voting rights, as well as the 1965 Voting Rights Act that tried to dismantle many of the undemocratic practices that have been preventing people from voting um, based on poll taxes, literacy tests, and other things, but really based on their race. There were later reauthorizations of that law that protected voting rights for people of color and language minorities as well. So let's talk about a few of these Utah women who were instrumental in suffrage work that continued even after 1920. After the 19th Amendment ratification, indigenous women and men and their allies had continued to fight for their voices to be heard and their votes to be counted. The Indian Citizenship Act somewhat ironically conferred US citizenship on all American Indians for the first time in 1924 individual tribes had received citizenship at, at different times. But many states, including Utah, still had laws that prevented residents of reservations from actually voting. And Utah only repealed that law in 1957. Indigenous nations and tribes in this region here have been led by women for centuries. And as that leadership converged with the recognition of citizenship from the federal and state governments, leading women like Mae Timbimbu Perry of the Northwestern Band of Shoshone continue to preserve indigenous arts and history and encourage others to use their voice and make a difference. Alice Kasai is another Utah woman who advanced voting rights for another segment of the population. 
People of Asian descent faced decades of discrimination as the U.S. was going through World War II and the Korean War in the 1940s and 50s. But even back to the Chinese Exclusion Act back in the 1800s, many people of Asian descent had not been legally allowed to apply for citizenship when they immigrated to the United States. When they couldn't become citizens under U.S. law, that also meant that they couldn't vote. And so thousands of women and men worked for federal legislation that would establish a more equitable practice of immigration and voting rights. So Alice Kasai was one of these people. She led the Japanese American Citizens League in Salt Lake City during World War II. During this time, her husband was imprisoned by the US government uh, be simply because he had been born in Japan. Alice worked to fight discrimination and build bridges of peace and cultural understanding. And she lobbied for more just legislation in this and many other areas. In 1952, the Federal Immigration and Nationality Act finally allowed people like Alice's husband, Henry, to become US citizens and gain voting rights for the first time. Another woman who worked for equality and voting rights here in Utah was Edith Melendez. Again, the 19th Amendment and local laws didn't mean that there was actually equity in voting for all women. And suffrage work continued in many forms, in this case, in translating and helping people register to vote. Edith Melendez was a civil rights leader and community organizer, and she often went door to door helping Spanish speaking Utahns register to vote. She offered them rides to the polls and tried to overcome many of those structural inequalities that made it more difficult for some people to cast their ballots. As the vice president of the Socio Organization, which was the Spanish speaking organization for community integrity and opportunity, Edith also worked for equity in policing and housing and state programs, another important piece of what the voting rights were intended to achieve. And finally, Alberta Henry. Even though Utah laws did not prevent people of color from voting, again, on the face of it, women of color still faced an uphill battle in securing equal access to the polls. 55 years ago in August, the Landmark Voting Rights Act of 1965 helped to dismantle some of the policies and procedures that had made voting nearly impossible in other parts of the country, but there were still problems to be solved here in Utah. Here in Utah, leading Black women like Alberta Henry, who was the longtime president of the Salt Lake NAACP, worked through that organization and through others to register voters, to combat discrimination, and to fight for equal access in employment and housing, in education and in public services. All of these women continued that legacy of suffragists from generations past who had worked for the ballot as a tool to improve equity and, and equality in, in local, um, state and national government. The contributions of these women and so many more who worked for equality at the ballot box are memorialized in a new sculpture in Salt Lake City um, near the state capitol. It's a sculpture by Kelsey Harrison and Jason Manley and the sculpture is titled A Path Forward. The sculpture sits on the grounds of Council Hall which is the building where Seraph Young cast her historic first vote in 1870 and it honors Utah women's role in expanding voting rights from 1870 up through 1965 and beyond. Different elements represent different pieces of the story that I've discussed with you today. For example, the table and chairs that represent the state constitution of Utah, door frames for the 19th amendment, and then a widening path and larger door frames as you follow a path forward with the important legislation I've just mentioned, the Indian Citizenship Act, the Immigration and Nationality Act, and the Voting Rights Act. Finally, the sculpture frames the Utah Capitol, showing that the work isn't finished, that work for equal suffrage began well before 1870, continued long past 1920, and continued even past 1965, that the importance of women's voices and women's contributions needs to be felt in our public decision-making halls and, and processes. There are still so many more voices that need to be incorporated into the historical narrative. And we're working to do that at Better Days 2020 by highlighting local Utah women who made a difference and who worked both for women's equality and for equality in other ways to advance um, a vision of a more just and a more fair society. As we look more closely at the story of suffrage in Utah, we can hear a multitude of voices championing a multitude of causes, but all of whom were motivated by a belief in women's equality, a desire to open doors of opportunity for themselves and for future generations. If you have any questions about the material I've presented here, if you want to learn more about the women featured in the illustrations by Brooke Smart or other women in your own local community who work to advance voting rights, 
You can visit utahwomenshistory.org to learn more or follow us on social media at Better Days 2020. Thank you.